on this uh, episode of I and I Nine, I have with me Professor Yan Shu Tong, uh, an original thinker and one of the finest scholars of uh, international relations in China, and a person with uh, the kind of uh, worldview which is very similar to ours uh, at Takshila. You know, it's hardcore realism. So I thought I I could ask uh, uh, Professor Yan. No, what what do you make of this? Uh, the, the the influence of ancient uh, foreign policy thinking mm -hmm. on modern uh, policymakers, mm -hmm. and in China actually you can realize that uh, our uh, national leaders to put more and more ancient sayings in their uh, uh, political speech, and uh, very recently, uh, no, not very recently, uh, last year in uh, September, and uh, uh, Chinese government issued a, a white paper on foreign policy. And uh, that paper, that document clearly stated and our foreign policy is guided by three elements. First is the traditional culture, the second is globalization, and third is the uh, specific situation in China. So you see, in this white paper, it, when they mention about the ideology or political culture, they mention about the traditional culture rather than the Marxism or liberalism or uh, democracy or any uh, modern uh, uh, concepts. So they use this uh, ancient uh, thought to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to talking about the, our modern policy. Right. So now let's let's uh, let's uh, move, uh, let's. I mean, your thesis is that as China uh, continues to grow, uh, a lot of uh, its foreign policy thinking will be influenced by ancient uh, yeah. frameworks of yes. thought. Now let's take it to the U.S.-China case. Okay. You had a very interesting article in the New York Times about oh, how yes. China is going to defeat uh, the United yeah. States. What do you, what do you what do you make of uh, of this line of thinking? Okay. And actually, the most people are talking about the competition between China and the U.S. And they are all focused on the material capabilities, and the GDP, and the major budget, but none of them talking about the thought, mm. talking about the ideology. Mm. And it seems to me, because of people, some people uh, believe that China is already a capitalist country, the same like U.S., so they have the same ideology. No, that's not true. And so from my argument that the competition between China and the U.S., not only in the field of the uh, material capability, but also is about the thinking, about the ideology, about the uh, political thought. So that's why I argue that whether China can win this game, and it depends on whether China can offer a good mor uh, morality and good international norm and good political leadership to the world. That's it. So basically you're saying that you change the rules of the game such that the rules are in China's favor, right? And then uh, because of that you have dominance over uh, the way international relations is conducted? No, actually, I don't think at this moment and China have the advantage in terms of international norms. And in the future, I also doubt and the world will move in that way and develop new norms which are in favor of China. I mean that the internal norm is a kind of thing which can evolve, it becomes more civilized, and the country can become the leader of the world, will, will, can offer more civilized thought mm. and ideas. Mm. For instance, and the, for the U.S., the core elements of the U.S. ideology is freedom, and uh, freedom, equity, and the, uh, uh, democracy. Right. But actually, if you're talking about the Chinese ancient uh, thought, they will talk about civilization. Civilization for me, for Chinese, is a higher level of morality than the freedom. Mm. And people have freedom, but then they may do something very bad. The civ civ uh, civilization is a, a civility, means that you have to behave yourself uh, uh, rightly. And uh, about the, uh, uh, like the uh, uh, equity. And everyone is equal, that's good. But then you find that equal will bring about the competition. But then what do we need? We need fairness. And fairness means what? The strong should take care of the weak. Just like a get on a bus, if we talk, everyone have the equal rights, then people will grab the seats, fight for the seats. But and then certainly someone comes the first and have the seats first. But then if you're talking about the fairness and that all of the strong young guys will leave the seats or yield the seats to the weak, aged right. people, children, and the pregnant right. women. Right. So this is, you know, this can happen in two ways, right? One is when there is an imposition of this kind of order by an overarching authority. The second one is when it's civilizational, when, yes. when you do it yourself. Yes. Now, uh, let's let's take both of these. I mean, whatever is the case, 
uh, if there is a clash of norms, mm -hmm. how do you think that the clash of norms will be sort of resolved? Mm -hmm. uh, will it be by force? Will it be by persuasion? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what would be okay. the way mechanism? Actually, the majority is the force, uh, determine the force to decide which norm will become popular. Norms only can be accepted by people and initiated become, uh, uh, become the people's internal uh, uh, behavior, and then it will become norms. So the, I don't think anyone can force any norm on the others. And if you want to make a norm to be accepted uh, popularly by the world, that first the norm should be consistent with the age and co uh, consistent with the life, and also it should be accepted by the majority of the people. Right. So you're, you're saying that. Uh, uh, it's not so much force, but it's it's more of persuasion, suasion, moral suasion, okay. which will will get to it. Very recently, I published an article talking about how the uh, norm becomes uh, uh, internalized in uh, 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 every country. From my understanding, and the leading country can make these uh, norms uh, popular uh, uh, in three ways. The most important way is to behave themselves. They should uh, set themselves as a sample. Yeah. Uh, if you cannot uh, force a norm on others while you do not practice, right. like, just like the uh, uh, Nepata to argue today. Right. Now, if the U.S. want to make others to obey to the internal law of the sea, and then the U.S. have to join, join the law. But when the U.S. Do not, uh, do not sign the treaty, they cannot uh, uh, ask others to do it. So the most important thing to make yourself a sample of this uh, uh, applying the uh, norm. The second, to punish those who violate the norm. And also, third, is reward those countries who abide to the uh, norms. Okay. Now let me take you to a slightly different context, right, uh, in terms of India-China relations. Uh, if you look at models, uh, the 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 geopolitical worldviews of these two civilizations are quite different. Uh, I mean, the, the, in terms of how they look at international relations with, with, them, with respect to themselves and other cultures is quite different. There are also two larger economies and powers of uh, Asia. How do you see this going forward? Let's say, you know, China becomes more uh, uh, prone to using uh, ancient uh, Chinese thought in modern policy and in a way, in a, in a probably less, uh, less structured way it happens in India as well. Uh, how, how do you how do you think it's going to play out uh, in the future? Well, my understanding that the the relationship between China and uh, India is uh, getting improved based on the uh, enlarged economic contact, mm. and uh, from my understanding that account uh, that base is a very uh, uh, is a very uh, vulnerable. It's not very solid. Mm. You can find uh, that, and uh, chi when China and the U.S. serve as the largest uh, trade partner to each other, and then we cannot develop a very solid uh, uh, strategic relationship. Mm. So, from my understanding, uh, based on the current uh, improved economic relationship between the India and the China, and China and the India should develop the security dialogue mm. and to create a base for the uh, strategic dialogue uh, 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 cooperation. But what might be the common interests in terms of uh, security? Uh, actually, from my understanding, and uh, if you look at, if you uh, we learn from the experience of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, mm -hmm. that organization started from the negotiation on the border disputes. Mm. So border disputes, it lay a condition for both India and China to talk about what kind of cooperation we should develop first. Mm. So you, 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 so what you're saying is put that border dispute thing first, and then work from there, right? Yeah. And that border dispute should be a, a start point for talking about the cooperation. Actually, there's two types of the cooperation. One is called the positive cooperation, that means work together against the third party. And second one is called preventative cooperation, that means prevent conflicts between us. So if China and the, uh, India can develop a very solid preventative cooperation on the border disputes, I think that will be dramatic uh, achievements which will lay a very solid uh, uh, ground for improving strategic relationship. Thanks, uh, Professor Yan. That was a fantastic uh, Thank conversation. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.